Good morning. Announcements for today. Uh, we acknowledge we are on um, Mi'kmaq ter- ancestral, traditional, unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. You are invited to join us in the church hall following the service for a time of fellowship, coffee, and tea. Our monthly mission for April is Trey, Trauma Recovery for Exploited Youth. The Board of Managers will be meeting on Monday the 15th at 7 p.m. in the Rose Room. Uh, Board games afternoon. The Fellowship Committee wishes to invite everyone at St. James Congregation to join them in the basement of the church on Saturday, April 20, from 1 to 3 p.m. to participate in a time of playing board games. Sunday lunch, a soup lunch will be held on Sunday the 28th. Following our worship service, there is a sign-up sheet in the welcome area if you would like to help by bringing soup, sandwiches, or cookies. If you have any questions, you can call or email Karen McLeod. Thank you for your part in this ministry to the community. Welcome this morning. As we gather and worship, may we turn together to our call to worship, and may we join together as God's people responsively. For Jesus prayed that we, the church, would be one. Just as he and the Father are one. Today we offer our praise and prayer together as as one one body body in Christ Christ, through the power power of the Holy Spirit. In harmony, let us glorify God, Father, Son, and Spirit. May we do so as we sing our opening hymn, More About Jesus.
Let us pray. Dear God, our Maker, we praise you for all the wonders in your creation, for the detailed perfection revealed in a baby's tiny fingers, in pussy willows unzipping their jackets to greet the spring, in each rock face worn by wind and water, witnessing to your ancient design. Like wrinkles around an aging smile, such details lift our hearts to praise you. So let the life, teachings, and resurrections of the risen Christ lift and instruct our hearts this day that we may greet a new week as an occasion to discover him in our midst, making all things new in springtime of your Holy Spirit. God, our Redeemer, in raising Jesus from the dead, you showed us your power to defeat all that brings fear and sorrow to our lives. Yet we confess we are sometimes uncertain if we can trust the promise of the resurrection for our lives. Forgive us when we struggle to trust your goodness for us. Forgive us when we miss the signs of your love in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yay! Glad to see you, glad to see you both. Didn't really want to be up here by myself. So, I brought this little pinwheel with me. It's not that fancy, but do you know how it works? Yeah, yeah like, okay, it will work better. There. I practiced this a hundred times. Had to make adjustments. Anyway, windmill. It's like a little windmill. So the more you blow, the faster it goes. So it's like a little miniature windmill. Have you ever seen pictures of a windmill? Have you ever been? I got to go to the Netherlands once and saw all kinds of windmills. Some people here actually have been there too or actually were born there and got to see them up close. But uh, windmills are really beautiful. They're really nice structure and they do like a lot of important work. Like the wind turns the big arms and uh, just, like, just like the little pinwheel, a windmill needs wind to make it work and it causes the blades to turn and then it can do different things. There were some that were like grinding grains and things, some were having electricity. So there's all kinds of things um, that the windmills would do. So in our lesson today, and the scripture lesson that's gonna be read when we go downstairs, um, there's, uh, the lesson is really talking about power. So the windmill has a lot of power, but they were talking about a different kind of power. And Peter and John were disciples of Jesus, and they had healed a man who couldn't walk, and they healed him because Jesus had given them power, but everybody that saw it were kind of really like amazed, and they didn't know, wow, 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 what happened here? And Peter said, like, why are you so, like, in awe? Like, why do you keep looking at us? Like, do you think we did this, like, on our power? Do you think we did that? And Peter told the people that no, that, that he didn't have the power to heal the man, that the power came from Jesus. And that applies to all of us. Like, our power comes from Jesus. So just like the windmill needs wind to give it energy and power, we need the love of God to fill us with joy and energy and power so that we can do important good work. And God is the source of our power. So that's our little reminder for today. Um, I'll just pray, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you that we can gather here this morning. We thank you for the reminders of the windmills and the thank you for the power that you give us through Jesus. And we just uh, pray that you will uh, be with us as we continue our time of worship and with us as our worship downstairs. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. He's going to beat us down there. <laughs> May we lift our voices once more in praise as we sing His Mercy is More.
Today's responsive reading is Psalm 4, verses 1 through 8. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Praise be to God. <clears throat> and so this morning in the New Testament we turn in Acts. In chapter 3, reading verses 12 to 19. So when Peter saw this, and this was the crowds and people reacting to this man being healed by him and John, and everyone was sort of, there was a bit of a tizzy, we'll say. How about that? So when Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Yet hand, you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is, it is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. So now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. O Lord, our God, our maker and creator, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks for how it guides us, how it teaches us, how it shapes us. We give thanks for the word made flesh and how in Christ we have been redeemed. And so by your word, by its saving, by its redeeming power, may we turn to your word again this day so that we might hear, that we might know, that we might believe all that you hold before us. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. And that I pray as I speak that my words would not be my own, but yours spoken through me that our hearts would come and rest upon you. You are our rock. You are our redeemer. And it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. Every age of those who have come to follow Jesus, those who have come to know God more, those who have come to seek, to knock, 
to pray, to ask, all so that they might find. Every age has always struggled with something that is both very similar in every age and also it has been different in every age. That is so often just the lens that we have as people. That we'll call it hubris or other things. But the reality is, no matter who we are, we sometimes just have a really hard time getting out of our own way. You and I are no different, and neither was it even in Jesus' own day. Sometimes, though, the danger of that, and especially in the world that we live in today, is that we often want to believe that we have all the answers. All we have to do is ask the right questions. Most of us carry around a device in our pocket or in our coat or somewhere so that if you just have the right question, it will spit out what you are hoping for is the right answer. But every age has always struggled with this, of looking through what we know. I want to show you a danger of what that can look like when we approach Scripture, but also perhaps how Scripture teaches us to have a different lens. And as Christians, that we have to have that lens in our everyday life to see what it is that God is doing. You see, because when we look at Peter here, just to give a little bit of that background of where we find Peter at this moment in history. This is Acts chapter 3. And so this is after the resurrection of Jesus. This is after the day of Pentecost. This is now when the baton, so to speak, when the church itself has taken fully on to that mission in which Christ has given to us, to his church. It is in here and in now, in this beginning part of Acts, where the church is going out and proclaiming Christ and him risen. Now, following the day of Pentecost, in that in-between time, between Easter and Pentecost, and as you've heard me preach on before, the disciples didn't know what to do. They were scared and afraid. We see that right after Easter and right after the resurrection. They are hiding in the upper room together. It is there that they are visited by Jesus. That's where Thomas was saying just last week, unless I see the hands, unless I see the side. We see even after in the end of John's gospel where Peter and some of them, they go back to what they were doing before unsure of what the next steps are until the day of Pentecost, where Jesus would instruct them that part of what they are going to do, part of what the mission of the church is, is to feed his sheep, to care for his lambs. And then following Pentecost, following the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon Peter and James and John and the other disciples that were gathered, we see a change. We see a physical, we see an emotional, we see a heart, a mind, we see all that they are changed. But sometimes it's easy, especially with our lens, when we're looking back and we can just make assumptions about who they are, that we miss the change that has happened. But it's right here in the text before us, because we have to look at who was Peter even before we get to Acts chapter 3. See, Peter, we know, was, well, Simon Peter, brother to Andrew. He was born a fisherman. He's probably the oldest of the disciples out of the group. Maybe, maybe not, but certainly he was the most senior of the disciples in many ways in the way that Jesus treated him. He was amongst that inner circle of Jesus. So it's not just those who would follow, like some disciples. We can even think of ones like Lazarus or Mary and Martha as the wide circle of disciples, Right? They're different than the crowds. The crowds weren't really sure. The disciples were a yes. The 12 disciples were a yes and even more. And then there was the inner circle, in which Peter was a part of that. We can see there was really no one closer to Jesus in many ways. And so when we see Peter stumble, when we see some of the failings that he has, we also have to think of grace. No one was closer to Jesus. No one had the firsthand experience that Peter had. No one had a better one. And yet we see moments where Peter, even all the way up to the resurrection, is stumbling. He's not sure. You're not sure of what I'm saying? Follow me with this. 
in the garden when Jesus is there. And on that night when Jesus is arrested, when the crowd of people come with clubs and whatever to take Jesus away, when there's guards and citizens all mixed together, when Judas comes and gives Jesus Jesus the kiss of betrayal, what is Peter's reaction? He jumps to Christ's defense. He draws a sword. He takes the ear off of one of the guards. Presumably, he was ready to fight more. It's not because of his own anger being put aside. It's Jesus' word to tell him to put his sword away, that those who will live by it will surely die by it. We can see Peter's reaction. It's one out of anger. It's going after vengeance. We can see his reaction of being scared. Later that night, everyone else is dispersed into the night. Peter goes with Jesus, although at a distance, to at least see, to see the trial, to hear. He's not permitted in. He's not a part of that group, but he can hear. But even then, he will deny Jesus three times. Peter is one of the first ones to go to see the tomb when the women come and tell him, but it's still Peter who is also unsure, who is scared of what the resurrection even fully means. And we, the danger would be, is that we could read what is here in Acts chapter 3. And of course, when we read what is there, we want to hear it like how they would say it. Now, the reality is, and I think anyone who stands at the pulpit has to admit, often how we read Scripture is not how it sounds or how it would have sounded in real life. We read it as Scripture and as verse to hear what we might learn, but, well, let's be honest. If we take what is here in Acts chapter 3, if we hear those verses of what was it that Peter was saying to the crowd, we can see, we can hear, we can allow that lens or that lens wants us to see here that Peter should have been angry. We can almost hear it in his words, right? Why do you stare at us? Why do you stare at us? If it's of, as if it's by our own power, godliness that we made this man walk, right? This is ancient, <laughs> this is ancient, <laughs> ancient Greek and then would have been Aramaic, This was Peter going, hey, what are you looking at? Right? If this was filmed in New York instead of the, hey, I'm healing here. Right? But not just the funny part. Beyond that, because when he goes in for the next lines, he is cutting deep. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. Right? He is provoking the name of God. He wants every Israelite, every person who is here, every person who, as I said, there was a bit of the tizzy of what just happened, and they weren't really sure. I thought we were done with this Jesus thing. I thought we were done with this healing thing. I thought we had killed him, and he was gone. And now you guys show up, and you're doing the same thing. Peter is saying it's not us. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Jesus, the one in whom our forefathers foretold who would send a Messiah. But then it's in verse 13. There's a you here, right? And it's a pointed you. Because it's not we handed him over. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. And though he decided to let him go, you, you, you asked that a murderer instead of the holy and righteous one be released to you. Peter is angry. We should hear his words in that anger. We should hear the hard being a wilting flower. He is aware that his words may get him killed because do not forget, he is pointing that finger at you, which is the same yous that only a short time before 
had cried out, crucify him, who had cried out, be rid of Jesus, in less words. You killed the author of life. I don't know how you can say those words with anything but without a bit of anger, a bit of almost venom, a bit of that P and V, and you'll know what I mean, kind of behind it. This is Peter letting all of that out. But remember I told you there's a danger? Remember I told you there's a problem when we just look at the psychological things or we assume on our own lens? You see, here we could assume and we could look at what Peter says and think, yeah, he's right. And he's got every right to say this. He is absolutely true in what he is saying. And Peter should let them have it, both barrels. But with that, we can miss the gospel. Because I don't know if you noticed in here, the gospel is on full display in the passage that we read. I'm going to show it to you. This is how you know that it's the gospel of Jesus. This is how you know that the gospel of Jesus is at work in someone's heart. This is how you know when preachers talk about being changed or being transformed, being saved, about the gospel completely getting into someone's life. And we see it here, right on the page with Peter. Because as much as his anger should and would and is allowed and all those things that we want to say where he's pointing the finger at you that you killed the author of life and that God had raised him from the dead and we are witnesses to this and that it's in the name of Jesus that faith has come and that he has been fully healed just as you can all see but the gospel shows up in this way because this is not the Peter who drew sword in order to defend Jesus. This is not the Peter who sought retribution or vengeance. This is not just out of anger. There is a harshness and a hardness in his words. There is a love. There is a love. And this is where we see the gospel at work in Peter. And this is where we are invited to see is the gospel at work in us. Because were we like Peter, were we standing there before those who had said and called out and crucify him, would we be like Peter and giving in and overcoming our anger? Would we be like Peter and wanting to draw a sword? Would we be like Peter and wanting to deny that we had anything to do with Jesus out of fear? Or would we be like Peter who instead would offer grace to those who, by his measure, by your measure, by all measure, would be the most undeserving of that grace. You see, it's one thing to say, well, those who didn't know, we can offer grace to. But Peter is offering grace to those who not only had heard, but who had seen. Not only who had seen, but then who had cried out, crucify him, who had not only crucified him, but then who had hurled all of those insults while he hung on the cross. Hail the king of the Jews. And it's before those people that Peter is then saying, come, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. I know you didn't even fully understand, even though it was right before your eyes. And let's be honest. Is that not one of the hardest things to be graceful when you've seen it and someone else has seen it and you're going, come on, why can't you get it? It's every parent's nightmare, isn't it? We've all been there where you're looking at the same thing that your kid is going and doing and you're going, how come you're not getting it? Well, then to turn to a friend and go, come on, why are you going out with that girl again? For the seventh time, we know how it ends, right? We can find example after example. Peter is standing there with the same people who had seen, who had heard, who had witnessed Jesus. And he's saying, I know you acted in ignorance, right? We almost have to hear that sort of half desperation. I know you acted in ignorance. 
and as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold to the prophets and that the Messiah would suffer. You see, as Peter, knowing and knowing in his heart that as much as that he wanted things to be right, he knew as well that what Christ had done was not just for him. It was not just for those who had been following. It had not just been those for who had got it right, but that it had been for the whole of the world. And it had included those who, as he would have marked as his enemy. It's like the psalm that so many of us know and have memorized, that so many of us hold a deep place. Many of us can recite the whole psalm without hardly even much of a prompt, Psalm 23. But do you know that part at the very end? He prepares a place for me, a table by my enemies. Peter is here with his enemies before him, but with the gospel in his heart, knows that they, like he, don't deserve a place at the table. But because of Jesus, instead, Peter offers that invitation. Repent, then. Turn to God so your sins may be wiped out. And that the time of refreshing, the time of renewal, of new life, may come from the Lord. How do we know that the gospel was at work in Peter's heart? Because we see his response to those who should be his enemies, those who he should have all that anger towards. But instead of seeing his anger, we are invited to see Christ's compassion and mercy and love. And so for you and for I in our lives, it is that measure. Is the gospel in your heart? Is Christ's mercy and compassion, and love what shapes you in your words and deeds. The good news is that we are invited to be like Peter, ones who might not have gotten it, ones who may yet still be trying to figure out, ones who have set it out of anger, or ones who have turned away from Jesus, and yet ones who are invited all the same come to that table to see and to know God's goodness and grace, to repent and to believe, and to offer that grace in all that we say and do as his followers. Amen and amen.
Oh, loving God, we pray that you would create in us hearts that are cleaned by you, that you would soften our hearts to your will and to your word, and that in all the ways that we are, that we would be a people of thanksgiving. For we give thanks, God, for all the ways that you have blessed us and that you teach us to be a blessing. And so, Lord, in all the ways that your Holy Spirit is at work in us, may we be that offering unto you so that in all that we say and do, that Christ, that his cross and his empty tomb, that his life, death, and resurrection would be proclaimed. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. May we continue to come before God together as his people in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our maker, source of Easter power and hope, for you have walked with your faithful people through many generations, people facing challenges and uncertainties, people seeking your purpose and promise. And we still face challenges and uncertainty, even with Easter in our hearts. And so walk with us, we pray, and walk with those whom we pray for this day, so that your resurrecting power may lead us in lives of faithfulness. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, hear our prayer. For we pray for children and for young people, who must think about the future in these uncertain times, facing old threats and new. Give them hope rooted in the knowledge that their lives matter to you. Show them how to make a difference in the world for your name's sake. And whatever threats they face as they grow, may they grow as well in the knowledge and the assurance of your love we pray for people whom age or experience or illness or disability has created barriers and disallowing them from full participation in your world. Surround each one this day. Surround each one that finds themselves in pain or despair. Surround them with your comfort. And renew in each one a sense of dignity and purpose. Show them how much they matter to you and to us. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, hear our prayer. For we pray for those who are facing grief, who are facing any kind of loss. Grant to them strength and comfort. We pray for communities that are challenged by forces beyond their control, whether it's natural disaster, environmental threats, whether it's conflicts or violence or economic hardships. Give courage to those who face those challenges. Bless them with wisdom for those who lead in troubling times. May, well, may well-being for all people be restored. And that peace, your peace, be across your world. So that hope, so that hope in you, that hope would prevail not only in our hearts, but that it would blossom in all of the wonder-filled ways. For as signs of spring emerge around us and bring forth their beauty and their bloom, we pray, O oh God, for your creation, for creatures, for habitats, for oceans. Teach us, God. Teach us how to be good stewards of that which is around us, of the earth, of people, of communities. Help us to honor you by caring 
or earth or people, and for the fragile balances and the ways in which we live, and to how to set our priorities to go after your heart. And so in these ways too, God, that they may know us by our love so that the gospel may be on full display in us and through us. Hear our prayers as we pray and as we pray together how Christ Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us once more join in song and praise together in our closing hymn, number 571. Lord, I want to be a Christian. song be our prayer, and may our prayer be sustained in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord's favor rest ever with you, and may you know the Lord's peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Thank you.